Good morning. I'm glad you can devote some time to worship this weekend. We continue to have one major announcement. Uh, we do have our fish fry coming up on September 12th, 6 to 8, outside in our parking lot. If it rains, we'll be in the fellowship hall, and uh, it'll be uh, our gift to the community. When was the first time you remember blaming someone? I'd be willing to bet that for most of us, we can't actually remember back that far. I know that I can't. I could guess probably fairly accurately who it was that I blamed for the first time, my younger brother, but I don't remember when it was or what it was over. I think that uh, we have this sense that blaming others, being in trouble and trying to get out of trouble, that this is something that is a uh, come so naturally that you might say it's rooted in who we are. So it's deeply rooted in, in who we are. If we look at what Genesis has to say about who we are, creation, how we are as created by God, uh, we find that blame game coming up pretty early in Genesis as well. Like we go through Genesis 1 and 2 and the goodness of creation and how humanity is made in the image of God and we understand being made in the image of God to mean that we are made to be in relationship. We are made to be moral uh, people, the creatures that have the ability to make moral decisions and understand that morality. Right? This is what we understand. And then we see that that ability to make decisions and to be in relationship is fractured. As uh, Adam and Eve uh, make a decision, they are told, you don't eat from this tree. And they do. And uh, they realize that they are naked, and so they experience shame. And then uh, God asks uh, Adam, what happened? And Adam looks at Eve and says, she made me do it. And then Eve looks and says, oh, no, the serpent made me do it, right? So we see the blame and the breaking of relationships and blame and making moral, moral decisions and making them poorly, right? It goes all the way back to the beginning of who we are. Whether you understand Adam and Eve to be a literal two couple, Adam and Eve, or you uh, understand Adam and Eve to be Adam, the or sort of beginning of humanity, and Eve, uh, Zoe, the mother of life, and sort of understand the sort of a, a that, that bigger way of under, reading it. Like either way, it doesn't matter. Like this is the idea. We see that in the beginning of humanity, we uh, sinned. We, we broke relationship. We started blaming each other. And Paul, in his letter to the church at Rome, ties this uh, to death. Like the, the, the wages of sin is death type of thing. He, he points out to, to the church at Rome, it's in Romans 5, that as sin came into the world through one person and thus led to his death, death came through sin. So then death spread because all sin. All of us sin in some way at some point in our lives, and the consequences of that are, are broken relationships that in the end lead to death. So what is the connection there? How, how do we understand this original problem? All right, There's been a lot of uh, ink spilled over the centuries trying to articulate it, this. Like, how are we connected to Adam and Eve? And what, are, what, what is the impact of Adam and Eve and that first decision, that first snack on the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Like how, how does that impact us today? We're going to gloss over, like there, there's a lot that has been written about how that is, uh, how we are connected to back to Adam and Eve, and we're going to not spend a lot of time with that today. What I want to look at is more how, what is the impact on, on us and how do the various parts of the Christian family understand that impact. And it should come as no surprise that the various parts of the Christian family disagree. What family agrees about everything, right? We agree that we follow Jesus, we argue about the rest. It seems to be a, the truth of the situation. So one approach that uh, to uh, looking at what happened with Adam and Eve and how it impacts us. And this is sort of like one chunk of the family on one sort of side of the family. This side of the family, uh, what the Reformed side is how they would identify themselves, uh, modern-day Baptist, Presbyterians, non-denominational, 
uh, churches. They would say that we have inherited the sin and the guilt. That Adam and Eve, they sinned, and so we, as their descendants, are, are equally sinners and equally guilty. The wages of sin is death. They died. We are guilty in that we are their descendants, and so we are going to die as well. This way of talking about the human condition is sometimes called total depravity, right? We are totally depraved. We are just born totally depraved. This, these uh, parts of the Christian family, because of this, tend to really focus on in the need for individuals to make a decision. Like You need to make a decision to follow Jesus because you are guilty. And it, that starts to sound like an altar call. Well, but the, it, it is, right? Um, I have to confess that this has not ever really resonated with me. Um, first, I don't really, um, like, I completely see how we are born prepared to sin. We are born ready to sin. We are born, one, one way of, uh, that has been passed down to think about what it means to be born as a sinner is to think of like uh, think of tinder, like shredded material that's just ready to light on fire as soon as you put a match to it, right? That we are born like that. We are born just ready to sin immediately. And that's what it means to be born as a sinner, is that we haven't sinned yet, but we're gonna, because we're, we're just primed to. And I think that might get at something. So I, I, I'm fine with saying we're all, all born uh, ready to sin, sinners, by that understanding. But guilt, like... I'll get in my own trouble. I'll do my own stupid. I don't need anyone else's stupid to be guilty of, and I don't understand how that, uh, how that would work, well, how that would function, how I can be guilty of, of something others uh, have done. And, and second, I really see more at stake than uh, just an individual decision. I think that our lives are wrapped up in, in, in our communities, our, our cultures, our societies, and so, yes, we need to make these individual decisions to follow Jesus, but that's not the whole picture. Like, there, there's, a great, there's a greater picture out there. So that's like one chunk of the family, and I appreciate the need of that chunk of the family to like really focus on individual decisions, but I, that, that's not really where I land. That's not really where Methodist, the Methodist church lands as well. So it's the other side of... Um, how we think, think about this. Another chunk of the Christian family, the Orthodox chunk, takes a different approach. And, and to understand the, who the Orthodox Church is, we do need to pause. I need to tell you just a, a bit of history. Um, in America, we tend to think of there being Catholic churches and then Protestant churches. And, and so there are Catholic churches, and if we go back to the days of Martin Luther in the 16th century, there were there, the Catholic churches. Martin Luther was a Catholic who started protesting, and so he, pro, uh, as a protesting Catholic, he started the Protestants. That is, and so Protestants are everyone that's not Catholic in America Lutherans, Methodists, Baptists, uh, Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, like that's all Presbyterians are all Protestants because they all come off of the Catholic Church. And so that all happened in the 16th century. We've had 500 years in, in Europe, in, in America, of the split between Catholic and Protestant. If you go further back, though, you go another 500 years further back before that, in 1053, there's an earlier split. Up to 1053, the church, when you talked about church, there was just church. And, and it was the church in the West and the East, like Europe, West, and then the East, Russia, Caucasus, Greece, Middle East, all of that, that's the East. And so in 1053, they had the final sort of falling out over this, an argument over uh, the Pope, the Pope being the special name for the Bishop of Rome, and the West, Europe, saying that uh, the Bishop of Rome could tell other bishops what to do, and the East saying, no, he can't. And... Um, they split over that. And so the Eastern Orthodox Church went its separate way. And we don't really see a lot of Eastern Orthodox churches. There's one in Colombia. I believe there's one in Moberly as well. They tend to have great food festivals, really great food. But um, 
the Eastern Orthodox Church, you can think of them as sort of like the long lost cousins of the Christian family. Like we, they're out there, we don't know as much about them, but they're definitely over there. And so if you think about Christianity worldwide, it would be Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox as the third major chunk of uh, the Christian family. And so if on one side is what I just described, the non-denominational Reformed Baptist Presbyterian approach, individual decision, etc. The other side would be uh, Orthodox. The Orthodox looks at, at all of the West and says, why do you get so obsessed about that individual decision? The Orthodox Church it, focuses far less on guilt and focuses far more on healing. They want to focus on how is the world healed? How is creation healed? They would look at what we read in Genesis about the, the turn away from God and see that this is a, a, a problem that has fractured all of creation, and creation needs to be healed of that, that fracturing. And, and so uh, at the, our response is, is to say, yes, there is the better t the term that the Orthodox Church would use would be something like ancestral sin. Like there is the, the sin of our ancestors that we are born into and that this is the way our ancestors did it. And so if we're born and raised to do the same, then we're going to do the same thing. Um, and so they're just gonna focus far more on, like that, that's, that's good to know, but like the focus is on the healing of, of, of creation, getting in right relationship with each other, uh, and understanding that following Jesus is about that, that focus on, on health. I have to admit, if I was going to land somewhere other than the Methodist Church, if the Methodist Church went poof today, I would probably go be an Orthodox priest. It would be quite the change. It's a very different way of doing church. But that, that sort of resonates with how I, that resonates deeply with, with how I think, right? L looking towards uh, the, the healing of communities, whole, healing of, of uh, peoples, healing of society. However, there is the Methodist Church. And what the Methodist Church does is, is understands that the Orthodox is getting at something, but it also doesn't let go of Paul. When Paul uh, writes talking about the law he goes a little bit further is in Romans 7 and he writes about how he is stuck in sin he writes uh, I don't understand Romans 7 I don't understand my own actions the th the good thing I want to do that's not the thing I do right it is the thing I don't want to do that is what I do wretched man that I am who can save me from th this problem Grace, the grace of Jesus Christ can do this, right? That, that's what Paul writes after, when he's sort of grappling with, with the sin. And, and the frustration just like leaps off the page, at least it does for me, because I hear you, Paul. I really do hear you, right? And, and what John Wesley does in, in, with the, the Wesleyan, the Methodist way of following Jesus is he, he gets in the middle between uh, these two sort of extremes of the Christian family. And, and various other churches land in various places, Lutherans, Catholics, like I can, Presbyterians, like I could explain how everyone lands, but between the two extremes, an extreme focus on an individual response because of individual guilt and individual uh, inherited sin, and, and, and at the other extreme, sort of the orthodox, the sense of like we're focused on the healing of all creation, like Wesley gets right in between. Wesley knows his church history and he knows his Bible really well, right? He gets in between and he says, we got to hold these two together. We got to hold them together because we need to make individual decisions because we are broken. We are racked by sin. We have this problem that the thing that we want to do, the, the, we want, that, that's not what we, we do. Like we have to struggle with this. And so we have to make an individual decision to follow Jesus because we have inherited this sin. We haven't inherited the guilt. Right? Wesley would not say we've inherited any guilt. He would say we are guilty of our own sin. You do your own stupid, I'll do my own stupid. Like that's, we are guilty of our own sin. But we, we need to respond individually. And he would further say, and I agree with this, that um, our ability to respond is something that happens by the grace of God. Like, we can be so wrapped up in the sin that we can't even see how bad it is. Like, 
that, that uh, hymn, Be Thou My Vision, like, there's something profoundly true about that. We pray that God would be, the, be thou our vision because we aren't going to see our own sin, our own stupid easily. Like We need God to help drag us, point us, nudge us towards an individual response because it is in that individual response we can say, ah, God has led me to say, I do have this sin in my life and I do need to turn and, and to say, I'm going to follow Jesus and accept that as a gift. And then, then we lead a lifetime by the grace of God coming together as God's people, as the church. We come together to spend a lifetime of grappling with the scars caused by sin. Our own sin and the sin of previous generations because we aren't born into a world that is just a fresh start. We are always born into the world that bears the scars of those who have come before us, and, and I think that's where we get into a lot of problems. We start talking about the brokenness of the world, and, um, and, and people can receive it as an attack. Like, I'm individually responsible for this. No, 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 no. We've inherited a broken world, and now we need to respond and grapple with that. Like, for, so Wesley holds us together. Individual response. I am a sinner. I need to choose to follow Jesus. And a holistic sort of approach that we are then seeking as the church to heal and to serve because there are scars that are deep and wide. As, what, as Wesley puts it, there is no holiness except social holiness. We, we make the world more holy, uh, we make ourselves more holy as we come together. And, and so for, for me, like the way that Wesley grapples with sin that we have inherited this problem, it, it is true and, and it grapples with the totality of, of, of who we are. Like we need individual decisions and then we need to grapple with the communities in which, which we live. And I believe that's the good news that this world needs to hear. Right? I believe that's the good news this world always needs to hear. But I especially believe right now this is the, the news this world really does need to hear. That we know that people's lives are broken and we have the good news that in turning to following Jesus that God calls us to, to turn and follow that um, we are then able to be in renewed relationships to each other and to God. And then, that's not the end. Our lives are then wrapped up in our communities and the world around us. And as people who follow Jesus, we are then led in, into loving our neighbors. Love God love neighbors. I believe it's in Wesley's understanding of how do we grapple with sin, we see the fullness of how do we fulfill those great commandments. Love God and love neighbors. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for calling us. We thank you for calling us this day and every day to turn towards you. Whether we are turning towards you for the first time or we're turning towards you for the the, the time beyond times beyond counting that we turn to you and that we hear uh, you forgive and accept and welcome us into a new life as people who lead that new life we pray that this new life might transform and serve and change the world around us that we might be partners with you in the healing of creation we pray for schools in missouri as they open next week as schools all around the nation we pray for all those who are working in hospitals who are overwhelmed. We pray for our leaders and our communities who are making decisions about how we will stay safe in the days to come. We pray for all these things as we pray in your name. Amen. I may the Lord bless you and keep you this day and always.